Today I want to do a reaction video on a couple of Fermilab videos on why light slows or bends in glass or water or other transparent medium. And Don Lincoln did these videos and he de debunked a couple wrong theories that you sometimes see on the internet, but he also got it wrong. And he got it wrong because he took the bias of there is no quantum field, so there's no derivation of the quantum field. And in order to get the right solution, you have to figure out why the speed of light is what it is in the quantum field, and then apply what you learn there to what happens in glass or water. So we can start with what we know. The speed of light is a function of permittivity and permeability. E mu equals 1 over C squared. It's that simple. And so we need to think of the permittivity and permeability first. Because that's another problem is he treats the speed of light like it's a constant even when it's in water and glass even though we know that it slows in water and glass. You know, that's one thing about scientific measurements. If you measure something slower you should believe your measurement. You shouldn't say, oh no, it's not really slower. That, that's a nonsensical approach to physics. And so we can also know, as I've discussed in other videos, the permittivity and permeability emerge from a polarizable quantum field. This is something Dickey mentioned in 1957, that when you have a polarizable medium, then those become fundamental constants that are emergent properties. And the way they come about is that if you have a bunch of dipoles, when a dipole rotates, it makes the other dipoles rotate. But they don't want to rotate, so it resists, so you get a torque. So the torque determines how rapidly you can polarize or magnetize the quantum field. The torque determines the speed of light. And the quantum field is the medium of transmission for light. Even if it's inside the glass of water, because glass of water is still mostly empty space, which just really means it's mostly quantum field. So when light enters glass, the glass, because it has more atoms, has greater torque the greater torque increases the permittivity and permeability, which decreases speed of light. And then in terms of the bending, we can follow Snell's law. And Snell's law says that N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. I'll look, put a little picture, but basically angle N is theta 1 and angle 2 is theta 2. And N is the index of refraction. Well, index refraction is normally treated as n equals c over v, where the speed of light divided by the velocity in the medium. So it's usually greater than 1. But we should really look at this in terms of permittivity and permeability to really understand what's going on. And then n is the square root of the dielectric constant which is the ratio of the permittivity in the medium and the permittivity in vacuum, epsilon naught. So epsilon over epsilon naught takes the square root. And so that tells us once again that it's effect due to the permittivity in the medium, in the vacuum or air at first, and then the glass or water. And with that, I'll just go ahead and show the first clip. So in this video, I thought I'd address a common one and give a correct explanation for why light slows down in water. Actually, that's just a catchy title. I want to tell you why light slows down in any transparent medium, certainly water, but also glass, plastic, and even air. If you ever took a physics class, you learned about the index of refraction of a material. The index of refraction is just a fancy term for how much light slows down in that material. The index of refraction, always written as little n, is a number greater than 1. 
and the speed of light in a material is just the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the index of refraction. I put a table here to give you a sense of how much light can slow down in common materials. This slowing down is the reason that objects look bent when stuck in water. It's because the path the light follows bends when it enters or exits water. It's the reason that you can get pictures like this one here. And I should let you know that no physics teachers were harmed in shooting that photo. There's a ton of interesting phenomena I could show you that arises because of the index of refraction and the slowing of light. But I want to focus entirely on the slowing thing. So, to do that, let's look at this animation. So suppose you have a piece of glass with an index of refraction equal to 1.5. That means that light will travel at two-thirds the speed of light in the glass. If you shoot a laser at the glass, the light from the laser will travel at the speed of light until it hits the surface of the glass. When it hits the surface of the glass, the light will slow down to two-thirds its original speed, and it will change its direction. Once the light gets to the other side of the glass, it will emerge from the glass, change its direction, and move again at the speed of light. That's what happens. In addition, the light emerging from the glass will travel in exactly the same direction. Well, more precisely, in a path that is parallel to the direction of the incident light. The path is offset a smidge to the left, but the angles are the same. So that's what happens. It's been tested, and there's no debate on any of that. And so his first clip, this little background clip, does a pretty good job. Um, but he doesn't mention the quantum field, he doesn't mention how light gets its velocity in the first place in normal space. Now, in the next series of clips I'm not going to show, he talks about how you can sum a photon in a field and get another photon with a different velocity. And the thing is, is that Photons aren't summable. You can't add two photons together just because they're superimposed. You have, if you have two separate photons, they remain separate. They don't interact. Unless there's a third particle or something that interacts with both of them simultaneously. And, but that's the unusual case. But in free space, they don't interact with each other. So you don't sum the fields, the way he describes. And he also describes a couple debunked ideas. One is scattering, and another is absorption and re-emission. And you can watch his video and understand it a little bit better. But basically, scattering and re-emission don't happen in the same direction. And they also tend to lose energy. So you don't end up with a beam of light going in the same direction with the same energy at the end. So ne neither of those solutions work. I'd like to call those the catch and release ideas. And he still sticks with the idea that, oh, light still travels the speed of light in a medium, even though we know it slows down. So with that, I'll play the second clip. So let's get back to light moving through glass or water. Remember that light is a wave of electric fields. It oscillates with a characteristic wavelength and frequency. Now, of course, glass is made of atoms, which are surrounded by electrons. Electrons have an electrical charge, and that charge feels a force from the oscillating field of light. Because it feels a force, the electrons move. But moving electric charges also set up their own oscillating electric field. Said simply, the oscillating electric field of light makes electrons move, which makes a second oscillating electric field. And if you have two oscillating electric fields, that's two oscillating waves, and you can add them together just like we saw before. The net effect is that the two waves combine and make a single wave of oscillating electric fields. And that is the wave that moves through matter. And, and this is important, it moves at a slower speed than light does in a vacuum. So as I said, he's trying to explain the slowing down by combining a photon with another field 
and he doesn't even address what's happening with the permittivity and permeability, which is the real solution. So moving on from there, we can talk about the bending of light. And as I discussed before, you have a change in dielectric constant, which is a change in torque. And so the torque is what causes you to have a change. And then I also wanted to mention here that if you have light coming in and bend and you see what's going on with the electric fields, if you extend it out in space, those fields along that arc are propagating faster than light. And this is a problem with bending no matter how you look at it. And in the next clip he complains that it's only a problem with this one model. So here's the third clip. A very common explanation used to teach why light bends involves soldiers marching over firm ground, but then who encounter mud, although not all soldiers hit mud at the same time. The idea is simple. The first soldier who encounters the mud cannot move as quickly as the rest of the soldiers, so he slows down. Each soldier hits the mud in turn, resulting in a direction change. Eventually, the lines of soldiers are moving in a different direction at a different speed. This is how it's often taught. The problem is that this doesn't work. In fact, the soldiers will slow down, but their direction doesn't change. They will continue to walk in the same direction, but with marching lines that are slanted compared to how they started. This explanation gets the angle of the lines of soldiers right, but not the direction of travel. In fact, the only way that this explanation can be right is if the lines of soldiers are rigid. Then, the first soldier hitting the mud puts a torque on the entire line, and that would work. The problem is that this torque means that the soldiers on the top of the screen move faster, which is to say that, if they were light, this part of the beam of light would have to move faster than light. So this explanation doesn't work either. So you can see from the video, torque appears to be the answer. And in any model of light, we have to account for how the fields appear to propagate faster than light during the bend. And anyone who's familiar with my channel will know that under the De Broglie model, you have effectively a quantum dipole in the middle and the fields extend outward. And they have to propagate instantaneously, as for every half wavelength, you could only get a half wavelength out with your electric and magnetic fields if they were limited by the speed of light. And you can see this when a photon gets absorbed when it hits something. The electric and magnetic fields are almost entirely outside the light cone. They have to collapse much faster than light in order for that energy to be retained. Otherwise, we would have random electric and magnetic fields that would be sustained forever every time a photon was absorbed. And I also wanted to mention that there were a couple other things he skipped over. One is uh, Fermat's principle that basically the least time principle, which doesn't actually explain how, and Huygens' principle, which doesn't really explain correctly how either. You can watch his video on bending of light in order to understand those a little bit better and why they don't really work. So I'll go ahead and play the last clip where he tries to explain the bending of light. It turns out that the only way to really answer the question of why light bends when it goes from air to glass is to get serious about the nature of light and to embrace the fact that it is made of oscillating electromagnetic fields. And that means you need Maxwell's equations. We start with light going from air to glass, hitting the surface at an angle. In our figure, we can replace the waves with the direction of motion. Now it turns out that the electric field of light is perpendicular to the direction that light is traveling, and we can add that field direction to the diagram. And it's very important to remember that this field has a component both parallel to the surface of the glass and one that is perpendicular to the glass. And here is where Maxwell's equations come into play. Two copies of the equations are written here, one that, that covers when light is traveling in air and one where it is traveling in glass. 
So here's the key point. The surface belongs to both the air region and the glass region. This means that at the surface, the equations on the top and the equations on the bottom have to apply. And with that little bit of calculus, you can find two important restrictions. The first is that the electric field parallel to the surface of the glass has to be the same in the air and the glass. And similarly, perpendicular to the surface, what has to be the same is the electric field times this epsilon, which is different for each material and depends on its molecular makeup. We can then manipulate these equations to see what the electric field in glass should look like. Because epsilon is bigger in glass than in air, that means that the perpendicular electric field in glass has to be smaller than it is in air. Now we remember that the direction the light travels is perpendicular to the electric field, so we can put in an arrow to show the direction light must travel in the glass. And finally, we can see what light does when it enters glass or water or any transparent medium. It bends. And the reason that it bends is because the epsilon in glass is bigger than in air. Okay, what I just showed you is an equation thing. You're probably asking yourself what that epsilon actually physically means. It's there because of how the electric fields from the light interacts with the matter in the glass. You start out with glass with no electric field in it. The glass has charges in it, but they're arranged in a random way. But when you send light in, you impose an electric field on it. That field makes the charges move around, which sets up a counterbalancing electric field from the charges. The result is that the electric field in the glass is lower than it is in air because of how the electric field from the glass is in the opposite direction. And this is the reason that the perpendicular electric field is lower in glass. And that, my friends, is why light bends when it goes from air to glass. Well, as you can see, he uses Maxwell's equations to explain the bend, although that explains it mathematically, but it doesn't explain how. But it does bring in the permittivity, although he doesn't bother to explain how the permittivity changes, which would actually give him the right answer, because the permittivity changes because of the increase in torque. So he ends up with the wrong answer because he's still trying to superimpose fields over a photon when photons don't superimpose with each other. So that's um, a nonsensical argument. And so that's how light slows and bends. You just go back to the torque changing permittivity and permeability and that gives you the answers. Now I also wanted to mention that when we have our sun and we have space, that if the torque increases as you get near the sun, not even in it, and not even in the actual plasma, if the mass itself increases the, the torque of the quantum field and increases the permittivity and permeability and slowing the speed of light, then that gives us general relativity. So we can develop general relativity as a strictly optical phenomenon. And we can have bending of light and slowing of light, such as with the Shapiro delay. And so all we need to do to get the right answer is to make sure that we include both a term where the wavelength gets shorter and the frequency gets shorter. And that's where Einstein failed when he initially tried to come up with an optical theory of general relativity is he failed to include the time shortening term. But once you do that, then you get general relativity as optics. And I wanted to mention that as an extra part of this video. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you do, please like and share it with your friends and subscribe for my next ones. And if you want to learn more about my research on quantum field theory, I have my books for sale. And I want to say a special thank you to my Patreon supporters who keep providing support for me. That's important. So thanks for watching.